monthly uh, office hours that we have for us and EMEA that occurs weekly. We also have a monthly one for those who are in APAC or if you have colleagues that are in the APAC region as well, those are on Wednesdays once a month on the second Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then we also do have two opportunities for you to dive in further if you're interested in helping us with development work in Python or Java. We also have uh, every other Wednesday's office hours as well to dive into that. And so with that from the semantic kernel side, we just have a couple of quick reminders and announcements as well. We do have um, some blogs around build and some announcements. I'll put the link to our blog all up. There are the recordings if you weren't able to attend any of the sessions live. And then there are some uh, also blog posts around different languages, Python, Java, and some of the parody that we're at as well. And so I'll link to that in chat. We're also going through a big docs update, so you should be seeing more updates on that shortly. So from the semantic kernel side, that's kind of the big announcement we have this week. I see we have some other folks on, uh, Evan M, Evan C, and Matthew. If there's anything else that you guys want to highlight before we turn it over to open Q&A, feel free to come off of mute. Um, that was exciting. Okay. Yeah. Evan. Uh, yeah, just wanted to say, you know, thank you all for a lot of the engagements uh, over the past couple of weeks, especially as we were heading into build. Uh, we really couldn't have done the 1.0 releases without the community, without all the feedback from these meetings. So just huge thank you uh, to you for, for participating and diving deep with us as, as a product team to deliver what things that you tell us you need. So thank you. And then I just wanted to plus one Sophia's comment on the doc updates. Um, I just shared kind of the updated table of contents starting to look really nice and there's a lot of samples and we go really, really in depth into all the uh, parts of semantic kernel. Uh, I know as as part of the last few months as we pushed for V1 and and try to get new features like filters and hooks and telemetry, um, not all of the docs uh, had all that content. It will soon have it. Um, so yeah, get excited. Um, hopefully that will help all of you get started and uh, continuing to learn advanced features of Semantic Kernel. Perfect. Uh, one, oh, and then I'll go for one last thing to remember. Uh, we do have, uh, hold on. We do have one uh, set of docs that is live already. Uh, so one of the persistent asks on us was to have API docs for Python. Um, thanks to the work that uh, Evan, Ben, and Edward did, we now have Python API docs. Um, so they've been automatically generated for us. There's a few uh, areas where we want to provide some more details uh, within those docs. But if you're a Python dev um, and you want to see all the different classes and functions, uh, you can check that out now. That's it Perfect. for me. Perfect. Thanks, both of you. Really appreciate that. And then just one last reminder from my side. Um, I've been seeing a lot of great questions in GitHub discussions. If you do have any questions, feature enhancements that you're looking for, feel free to bring them up there. We're going through and triaging them on a daily basis as a uh, semantic kernel team. And so we'd love to be able to hear from you and be able to dive into questions there. But I'll go ahead and turn it over to the community now for any questions that anyone has. Feel free to come off of mute or put them in chat. And I'm happy to read them out loud as well. Perfect, I see our first hand up. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is uh, Pradeep. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, hey Pradeep, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, hi, well, hi. Uh, it was nice to meet, uh, you know, uh, all of you at the build uh, last week, so I was there in person. Uh, the question I had, and uh, we've sort of been experimenting with the newer agent, uh, the assistant agent classes that have been introduced. And uh, one of the things we found, I think it sort of abstracts away a lot of the uh, things like thread and all that, right? But one of the drawbacks we found was because it doesn't expose the things like the thread ID to you, uh, we weren't sure how do I 
uh, let's say once I've created uh, assistant age and I've started a conversation thread, how do I uh, continue on that conversation thread? I mean, in the, in the console app, it's easy, right? But in the web app, you're sort of going in and out. How do I resume a conversation on the same thread so I can take advantage of all the history? That's a great question. Um, you're not going to like my answer. <laughs> Uh, today, it, it, I believe it's technically impossible. It's the number one thing that we're trying to prioritize right now. Um, there's two pieces of it. One, just giving you kind of uh, some sort of input so that you can provide a thread ID manually if you have one. Um, probably more important to me, though, is we have this group chat concept, which I'm assuming you're using, which allows multiple agents to work together or just have one agent inside of that group chat with the, with the user. Um, right now, it's not possible to serialize that. Uh, so as you mentioned in console apps, it's great. You can do back and forth conversation, you tear it away or throw it away and you're, you're fine. Um, but if you have a web application, you want to persist these things, you need to be able to serialize that group chat with all of its yeah. messages, its thread IDs and the participants. Uh, so that that is a known gap. And hopefully within the next few weeks, uh, we'll continue revving our experimental agents framework so that we can get that included. Okay. Oh, so that's something being worked on. So, so right now we kind of fell back to the uh... The actual yeah, assistant classes itself. So you think uh, this should be coming in like a month's time, possibly? If it's if it's available a month from now, I would consider that too late. <laughs> oh so really? It's, okay. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, um, it's it's from what we've heard from customers, that's like the biggest blocker from them adopting uh, the new agent framework. Uh, so we are prioritizing it very highly. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Great question. Great other questions folks have. I see another hand, uh, Rigoberto. Um, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. If you want to come off of me, we'd love to hear your questions. Yeah, you pronounced it just fine. Just a quick question. On the 15th, I uh, yet explained how uh, how we could use uh, on May 15th, how I could see what um, functions were called by the automatic function caller. Uh, but I had to take your answer. Um, I had to draw for a work call, but that recording hasn't gone up yet. Is that going to be up? I think calls from the 15th, on, uh, recordings from the 15th on have not been there. Is that just be pending or? So you can blame else? you can blame me for <laughs> those calls not being. Uh, record and sent out. There was uh, one session where I didn't hit the record button. That might have been the 15th one. Um, Sophia is a rock star and <laughs> been able to get the other videos. Are you able to share more on that, Sophia? Yeah, I was about to say. So yeah, the 15th, unfortunately, that recording we don't have before May 22nd and May 29th. Those should be uploaded in the next probably day or two. The team has the recording links. But if you want to re-ask your question, yeah. we'd love to be able to dive yeah, in. Yeah, I was about to say, I have a follow-up question then. Uh, so how do you uh, see which uh, functions were called by, by automatic function calling if, if you put that in place and, and, and use it? Yes, and this is why I love our new updated doc. So let me pull up uh, the page. It's not out yet. So in the next like uh, uh, day or two, cool. um, but let me pull up the page that I just wrote where I cover that. I can get this page actually loaded. Uh, what is going on? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay. Gosh, okay, well, okay, that's not working. So we're just going to share ah, the markdown file. Okay, so if we go to we are and we go to our chat history so whenever you um mm -mm. here we go so whenever you create a chat history so in this case we're building a chat history 
that says the user wants to order pizza. Uh, we go ahead and then, of course, send that to our chat completion service um, with automatic function calling enabled. Uh, that should actually probably have execution settings um, with automatic function calling enabled. Uh, this will then make all the function calls. We will do the function results. Uh, behind the scenes, though, what we're doing is we're actually manipulating that original chat history and adding those um, uh, extra messages. And so if you want to inspect uh, what function calls and function results were made, um, you can take a look at that original chat history. Uh, and here you can see I got the original length and then I'm looping over all of the new messages, anything after uh, that original length. And here I'm just printing it out. But if you wanted to, you could inspect, hey, what was the function call? What were the arguments? What were the results? All that information is available for you to kind of post process uh, whatever happened. Now, this is very reactive. This is basically looking um, uh, after all of the activity has happened. In most cases, you actually want to be more proactive, like as the function's being called, you want to uh, catch it so that you can either approve or deny it or add telemetry or provide some sort of uh, UI experience back to the user, letting them know that a function is being called. For those scenarios, uh, what we'd recommend is using our uh, uh, filters and hooks. Filter hooks, semantic kernel. And for that, I'll go ahead and um, uh, share my screen again and show the blog post that uh, Sophia and Demetra worked on. Um, but there is a. Mm -mm -mm. We have what's called an I function invocation filter, which is called whenever functions are called. Or invoked, uh, and so you could have either logic before or after uh, that function was invoked so that you can uh, do all the things I just described. So telemetry, uh, uh, approvals, sending information to the user, whatever it might be. So I'll also drop this in the chat. Awesome. Okay. Great, Pradeep, do you want to come off of mute? Yeah, hi, a quick uh, follow up question. Uh, any uh, timeline on when the agent classes will be available in Python? Uh, we're picking that up now, either this sprint or next sprint. Um, uh, until we start, we won't entirely know what the velocity looks like, uh, but the goal is uh, sometime early summer in the next month, month and a half. Uh, we'll have that available. And this will include the assistant agent also, not yeah. just chat completion. That's correct. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Thank you. Um, we are also actually a question for all of you. So there's been several other agent services that have popped up from, uh, I know there's one from Amazon, uh, and then there's, I believe, one from Google. Uh, we are trying to gauge interest on whether or not those should uh, be included in our agent framework uh, before we make it non-experimental. Um, and if the answer is yes, which one we should prioritize. Uh, so if if any of I know most of y'all are just interested in using the OpenAI or Azure OpenAI Assistance API, um, but if folks on this call are interested in the Google or Amazon equivalents, uh, let us know in chat which one you'd prefer, and we can use that to help prioritize which one we we build first. Our, our main driver was the the CMK support that's going to come in the Assistant API, and in fact, we had not wanted to use it once. Uh, the build they announced this will happen, so that was a big driver for us to start using. I mean, I don't know if the other CSP is supported. Uh, say, so are you saying CSV? Is that right? Uh, uh, no, no uh, the other vendors like Google and Amazon. I don't know if they support uh, customer managed key for a conversation state, but uh, this one does, right? The assistant API does. The Azure, the Azure version does. Um, that sounds right. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the call explicitly knows. Yeah, it looks like we're not entirely sure. Um, yeah, and, and even if I guess even if the service doesn't 
have that level of support. We have seen other customers use things like APIM um, to have greater control over that. Uh, but yeah, I actually I remember talking to one of the PMs in Azure OpenAI, and uh, she was telling me how <laughs> that was one of the features that they were working on. So that makes sense. Twenty uh, fourth June is what when they said it will come out. So. Cool. Cool, cool. Oh, and thank you, Chris. Right in that. Perfect. Thank you, Pradeep. I have seen a question in chat from Steve, and it's actually one that's popped up in community. So I think it's a good time to kind of dive into a bit further. Is the agents and autogen relationship are those merged at this point? Is it still a work in progress? What does that look like? Yeah, great question. So with our agent framework, we we've, we've taken in most of the core abstractions with autogen. Um, so if you're looking for like an enterprise version of autogen. Uh, you can start trying it out with uh, our experimental agent framework. As mentioned at the very beginning of this call, we do have some known gaps, uh, serialization being number one and number two being streaming. Those will be coming soon uh, and those gaps will be addressed. And once they do, we'll also be recreating a lot of the samples in Autogen. Um, now, previously I mentioned that there was work uh, in the .NET side, not the Python side, to kind of unify bridge the uh, .NET Autogen library and semantic kernel libraries. Um, now that we are this close to uh, completing those gaps, the .NET version of Autogen looks like, um, but until those gaps are fully addressed, uh, we are putting the uh, merging work uh, on hold. Our question. Perfect. Thanks, Matthew. Other questions folks have, feel free to come off of mute or add in chat as well. I have a quick one. No one's asking. Um, yeah, go for it. It looks like you may be on uh, mute, Rigoberto, or if you want to come off of mute, you may have accidentally muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, she had mentioned in the past that chat history needed to be fixed, and I, I, w I never was sure what you were referring to. So what were you referring to, and is that fixed? Am it I misremembering? Be, it needs to be fixed. Like, are you yeah, saying like I'm something? Yeah, I thought you had mentioned something uh, about chat history, um, something had been wrong with it and there was there was an effort to fix it. Maybe I'm misremembering. I think you would remember if that was the case. I don't think so. So I can tell you what's been enhanced and kind of what's coming next. I don't know if it was ever, I guess, broken per se. Um, yeah, it has one of the things, yeah. yeah, one of the enhancements that we just recently rolled out over the last few weeks is if you imagine a chat history, you have like user message and assistant measures and system and uh, one that was uh, used internally by automatic function calling was a tool message, right? And so with the assistant and tool messages, you could have function calls and function results. Um, but if you actually looked at uh, uh, the innards of that, we didn't have any abstractions for what a function call and function result looked like. Um, we basically were just using the open AI kind of uh, uh, properties inside of the inner content, right? And so if you as an app developer wanted to have access to that information, it was a little bit challenging because you had to break class and go directly to uh, the classes provided by open AI or Gemini or Mistral, whatever was using function calling. Um, so that's been changed, that's been updated. Um, so I want to just uh, pull up some of the docs that we're working on. Um, what what this allows us is we've introduced two new content types, one for function calls and one for function results. And so when you are creating your history, not only do you have the ability to create uh, user message, assistant messages, and uh, system messages, but you also are able to add assistant messages with multiple tool calls and messages from the tool role with function results. Um, I am personally super excited about this feature uh, because there are some edge cases where 
um, or, or for performant reasons, you don't want the AI to have to actually manually call a function. You already know that the AI needs to have some particularly new information. And so with this feature, you can have a chat history object uh, and basically have simulated function calls and uh, function results in the chat history uh, to kind of speed up the process of the AI answering the user's questions. Uh, so that's one thing that we've added, and we haven't really talked about it too much, uh, but it will be added as part of our updated docs. Um, the other thing that's more future looking that's coming in the future is if you've been using our templatized prompts. So if you like, uh, it, basically have those messages where it's like, oh, here's a user message and system, et cetera. Uh, it's today very difficult to take a dynamic chat history for like a back and forth conversation and add it inside of one of those prompts. Uh, this is something that uh, LangChain has some placeholder concept that allows you to kind of inject uh, a chat history inside of a larger prompt. And so as part of our summer roadmap, we'll be adding that functionality. Um, so that if you wanted to, you could actually do an entire automatic function calling loop with just a prompt and never, ever look at the chat completion service. Um, so that's kind of the thing that's coming next regarding uh, chat history. Uh, so hopefully that was uh, some good context of kind of how chat history has evolved over time and we'll continue. That's to great. Uh, Perfect. In chat, I'm seeing one from Mohammed. Are there any open source LLMs uh, models that support function calling, which can be used with semantic kernel? So I haven't tested these yet. I know on Hugging Face, I'm aware of uh, the, the, the Llama function. So there's a Llama version. Uh, that supports function calling um, that uh, folks can try out. And then someone told me literally last week that there's a Phi 3 version that also supports function calling. And you kind of see how they support the kind of typical weather stuff. Um, like I said, it's, it's kind of on our team's to-do list to actually test this out and see if it works since uh, one of the big takeaways that we got from Microsoft Build was there was a ton of interest in local models. Um, one of my personal concerns, though, is uh, even between your Gemini's, OpenAI's, uh, Claude's, whatever, there is a very large difference in quality of which models can do function calling and function calling well. Um, and so uh, one of the things I do expect is these local models, just because they're smaller, uh, they probably have less training data for function calling. They probably won't be as capable as your GPT-4, 0, or O models. Um, but I, I do suspect there will be some smaller edge cases where those local models will be sufficient for function calling. Um, for local vector DBs, I guess a, a quick aside on that one. Um, as part of my build demo, um, I actually use Wev8 because they have a local vector DB story. Um, so Wev8, if you uh, uh, go to the website, they actually have a Docker container that has Wev8, and you can just like point semantic kernel to it uh, so that you can start start working with it. Um, a lot of people are like, Matthew, why are you putting Wev8 on stage when we have this wonderful thing called Azure AI Search? Uh, I think having a local story to test and try things with VectorDBs is important, and you can do that with Wev8. And one of the values of the connectors in Semantic Kernel is when you do start to upgrade, when you do go to production, or when you need additional quality, you can easily upgrade to something like Azure AI Search uh, by just replacing a few lines of code um, uh, so that, yeah, you're not using that local Docker container uh, anymore. Uh, Pradeep? Yeah, hi. Uh, so this might be a bit of a philosophical question. So now with 
a lot of the newer abstractions you've introduced in the assistant agent, right? And with the group chat feature, is there a compelling need for me to use Autogen at all? This wouldn't this serve all my needs? So where do you see the future? Would would Autogen be like a separate framework or would it whatever feature is there, is that going to be baked into semantic kernel itself? Yeah, so I, I do see uh, separate needs for both of these projects. Um, one, Autogen, at least the Python version, is owned by Microsoft Research. And so they're going to keep discovering new patterns, uh, writing papers about them, telling us about it so that we can tell customers, build samples, what have you, right? So that's, that's one. Two, because we're more of an SDK, we try to, that that has things V1 and we commit to all of you, we're not gonna have any breaking changes. It's really, really hard to commit to not having breaking changes if you have highly opinionated implementations of things like a group chat. So if you notice how we actually implement it within Semantic Kernel, we don't have super highly opinionated group chats like Autogen has. We have a single group chat where we have uh, basically placeholders so you can say, hey, you can put any arbitrary termination logic here or any arbitrary select an agent to talk logic, right? Uh, we believe that will then be flexible enough so that you could build any scenario that Autogen comes up with in the future, right? Uh, but if you're a customer and you don't want to like deal with that, if you don't want to have to create those custom uh, routing logic and termination logic, that's where the value of something like Autogen comes in because theoretically they have it oriented and you can just use it out of the box, right? Um, and that's why I'm super passionate about, at least on the .NET side, having their library built on top of Semantic Kernel, because it tells that it makes that story a little bit easier to tell. Hey, no matter what you're doing, you're using Semantic Kernel. But if you're using the Autogen library, you get a bunch of uh, group chat strategies out of the box for free. Okay. And if you kind of want to stick with the, uh, when we actually started with .NET and because of Python was sort of the predominant skill set within the team, so we kind of switched to Python, uh, but we still continue to perform experimentation in .NET. So if you wanted to just stick with one frame, we kind of like all the other abstractions that Semantic Kernel gives us, like plugins, planners, and all that. So would you recommend we just stick with a group chat feature that SK offers? All we're interested in is like simple multi-agent orchestration, so. Um... Okay, so just to repeat back what I'm hearing. So it sounds like a lot of your team has migrated over to learn how to use Python so that, that they can use the latest AI stuff. There's still some affinity to .NET since that's what people are familiar with. And in Semantic Kernel, that's kind of the ahead library for lack of a better term, right? Um, so I guess a, a couple points. I would suspect that .NET will be ahead for just a little bit longer. Um, as I mentioned, Python is working on getting the agent abstractions and should be available in the next like month and a half or so. Um, we have essentially doubled our Python team because we're starting to upskill a lot of the semantic kernel uh, team members that used to do just .NET. Now they're doing Python. Um, so you start seeing extra velocity from Python. If anything, it's going to start leapfrogging .NET. And so I think you're Yes, you're in an awkward point right now where you want to use features that only exist in .NET, but I suspect it won't be very long before you're like. We're in a painful very soon. Python's going to be kind of at parity period, and everyone can just use Python and be happy. The second point that I'll make is one of the, the the big kind of announcements and story that we told at Microsoft Build is because we have libraries in Python, .NET, and Java, and because they all use the same underlying concepts and assets, if you do decide to build a POC in Python, but then build the enterprise equivalent in .NET because it's going to be more scalable, you have things like dependency injection, you have a better telemetry story, what you'll be able to do is take those assets that you build into Python and literally just copy and paste it into your .NET version of Semantic Kernel. Uh, so if you haven't taken a look at our recap video from Microsoft Build, I just uh, I think we already shared the blog post, but I'm sharing it again. Definitely give that video a watch. If anything, it's fun. <laughs> I turn on some lights and I play some music, uh, but it does show that kind of progression of 
hey, I build something in Python, and then I move it in .NET. OK, thank you. Yeah, for sure. And, and I guess in the short term, you, to just more specifically answer your question, um, I think it's up to you on timelines. So if you like need something now, use the .NET version. If you're able to wait uh, like a month, um, it'll be in Python. That's what we've been doing, I think. So I think uh, uh, we were able to, I think Python has most of the features of .NET except the agent one. And so the way we've been doing is anything uh, experimental, I think we're continuing to use .NET, but uh, sort of the stable one, like all the plugin planners, so all that we are using Python. Perfect, perfect. Oh, oh. Great. There's a question in the chat from Mohammed. Are there any semantic kernel integrations for out of the box plugins to work with SQL databases as a RAG or Databricks SQL, et cetera? Great question. Um, so we don't have anything out of the box. Uh, one of the primary reasons is early on, I think there was something in the water like last summer where everyone's like, oh, we're going to have these agents write SQL queries. Uh, it just didn't perform very well because in order for an agent to actually write effective SQL queries, you have to give it the entire database schema, all of its relationships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most of these things are very highly domain specific. And so it kind of overwhelmed these LLMs and uh, it wasn't good, right? Those also around the same time that function calling was launched. And so we saw customers be much more effective of taking views or stored procedures that existed on top of their databases and turning them into functions that they could then give to the LLM. Because then you're not asking the AI to write arbitrary SQL query that it'll probably get wrong. Instead, you're asking the AI hey, use this function to get this specific type of information from my SQL query. And behind the scenes, you can write all the complicated SQL query to actually provide that information. Now, we are increasingly hearing a, a greater need for this. Um, and it's been a while. The models might be more capable. There's probably some models that speci specialize in writing SQL queries. Um, so we'll probably revisit this in the future, uh, but it's not currently uh, high on our roadmap because most customers are uh, best served today with just function calling. Oh, so uh, one thing over here. So function calling with uh, store proc or views, right? So directly uh, we can call views or store proc into function calling, or you are saying we need to write some kind of wrapper, meaning some kind of API endpoints, which will ultimately call the behind the scene the store proc, right? Or yeah, directly, I can call uh, the Istro proc or something like that. You'll need some sort of wrapper because um, mm -hmm. you'll have to like semantically describe, hey, this is the okay. function, this is what it does. I would hope that you already have APIs that pull mm -hmm. this type of information. Um, in fact, I'd be shocked if you didn't. Like, I hopefully like there's a web. You have some sort of website that pulls information from here. You have some like report that pulls information or yeah. uh, services talk to it, right? So you should actually be able to reuse those APIs if they're defined with a Swagger file or an open AP file. And you just mm -hmm. import that into Semantic Kernel. Okay, makes sense. And then Evan just uh, shared a, uh, a sample uh, that also demonstrates how to uh, do something similar with um, uh, Microsoft Fabric. Okay. Yeah, this one, uh, NL2 uh, SQL, right? Uh, it was very long back. I mean, uh, there is a sample available in SK, right? Way back, right? And I think it is no longer maintained, right? Where entire DB schema, everything is basically, we need to vectorize it actually, right? And then on top of that, uh, it is generating the SQL query out of the box. And it is, yeah, not really working great uh, for each and every, if database is very big, so that is not correct, actually, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, yeah. One day, one day these models will be super smart and be able to do all this relational stuff. But from my, my experience, these models have been trained predominantly on Python and other mm -hmm. functional languages. They have not been trained very well on SQL. Uh, queries, because I, 
like if you think about the internet like how many open source projects do you know where they just check in sql queries yeah and you so really like, don't want you know, from a security <laughs> standpoint you actually don't want the lms to create sql on behalf of your user because i can say hey can you drop all the tables and it says yeah i know how to drop all the <laughs> tables no problem like drop all boom gone sql database not there anymore. Or like, hey, can you add me as a user? Here's a username and password. Oh, I, I know how to add users to SQL, sure. So like from that standpoint, again, that's where you really want to use either the API schema or use in stored procs to, to have that pass over. Um, and that way you you don't have these big security holes uh, letting LMs do write, write code and execute it on your SQL server. It, it, just building on Evan's point, like, we should kind of think of the LLMs as like other software developers that are sitting in the same org as us. You wouldn't tell your front end dev, here's the database, <laughs> write queries directly to it. No, you would say like, oh, for your particular use case and your scenario, I'm going to give you explicit APIs that make your life easier. Um, and if, if we kind of have that same empathy towards these LLMs, they're going to, uh, accomplish their jobs much more easily. And to Evan's point, uh, they'll be constrained so that they don't do something that they shouldn't. That was the first time I've said have empathy on the elements. Kareem, <laughs> <laughs> just looking through chat, there is one other questions of when there'll be updates to semantic kernel that take advantage of the latest version of GT, uh, GPT? Oh, GT4, oh. Uh, so what was, what was super confusing, at least for a lot of us in the AI community, is like OpenAI was like, wow, this new thing called GT4 Omni is amazing. And here's this demo we're going to share our screen and talk to it. Um, and then their API docs remain the same. And so if, if you want to use GDP 4.0, like the APIs that talk to OpenAI uh, and Azure OpenAI, they're the same, which means you already can use it, right? We do suspect at some point OpenAI will drop additional APIs to more easily use some of the functionality that they demoed uh, uh, during their dev day. If and when that happens, we'll uptake it uh, within Semantic Kernel. But as of right now, you already have access to all the features that everyone else has uh, for GTP 4.0 uh, within Semantic Kernel uh, because the APIs literally didn't change. All you have to do is you probably have somewhere with a string that says use GTP 4, add an O to it, and you're good to go. <laughs> Not seeing any other questions in chat as I'm looking through. Does anyone else have anything else they want to come off of mute or dive into? Oh, great, Colton. Yeah, I just wanted to get thoughts on uh, one idea. I I expressed it in the discussions, and um, I went back and forth a couple times. But I wanted to get thoughts on the idea of being able to edit the plan generated by the planner. In particularly in the Python SDK, so I, I know you can essentially rebuild it yourself. You know, if you were to build your own planner, but with the planner as it exists, uh, particularly the stepwise function calling planner, it sort of proposes the plan internally and then acts on it. I couldn't find a way without dissecting it to take that plan, edit it, and then execute. Is there any plan to, uh, I guess, add that functionality, or is there a way to do it I'm not aware of? So that's, I don't think, yeah, I don't think that's available in our planners today. Are you able to share more about when you say edit? Is this a, a user operation? Would you have another LM edit it? What, what are you thinking? Oh, no, I was thinking like uh, user editing. So, for example, if I wanted it to make function calls, and it, the function calls it's suggesting are either inefficient or maybe it's missing out on one. I'd like it to throw in there for extra information. Um, that would be really nice. So for example, Gosh. I have one that like gather, it does a Bing search, but then whenever you do the Bing search, it just gathers like the high level summary of a website. So there's, I have another plugin that can then go into the actual website, 
but occasionally it will just do the Bing search as opposed to accessing the full website. So it'd be nice to just say, oh, call this um, function as well, or you know, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, it, so I'll just say uh, we don't support that today with our existing planners. Um, this is an interesting use case. Uh, when we did our build session, uh, Fujitsu uh, came on stage and they shared their custom planner and they actually had this exact type of scenario where they ask the agent to come up with a plan, they visualize it and the user could add like new steps or remove steps. Um, so I am starting to see this pop up more and more. Um, let me let's put that on our our backlog in the short and medium term, though. Um, I would expect you'll have to create like a custom planner where the first step is like, hey, generate the list of steps or recommended steps, um, have the user approve it, and then you could build some UI on, on top of it. Um, I guess for your for your scenarios, you need a relatively structured plan for you to visualize it in the UI. Is that correct? Right, or, right. It it yeah. Um Okay, so yeah, let me let me think about that a little more. The, the for everyone else on the call, um, just so that you're aware, we are planning on uh, sunsetting our current planners because they just don't perform as well as automatic function calling. We do want to provide um, some solution for folks that need to see like the entire plan. I think Colton has a really good example or scenario for this. Hey, I need the whole plan so that the user can approve it or change it or have you. Uh, the rest of the industry has started moving to Python code as kind of like the language for plans, um, since the models are much more adept at writing it. Um, and so, Colton, now that I started to internalize your your requirements, um, the the challenging bit will be if we are using these Python plans, how do we allow users to easily update that and change it? Uh, because I can almost guarantee that your users don't know how to write Python and, and how to update it. Um, so that will be a, a fun problem to solve. Perfect. That sounds great. And yeah, the like you mentioned in the build session, the Fujitsu example is actually um, part of the inspiration behind it. That was kind of exactly what we were looking for. Cool. Cool. cool, cool, cool. OK, great to hear. Uh, yeah, they, they had to build something custom for the, for the time being. There's a question in chat. Can you explain how auto function calling works behind the scenes? Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to pull a quick doc. Okay. Okay. OK, so uh, automatic function calling. Let's see. So real uh, what are you? Oh, you are seeing the wrong screen. Uh, let's flip this swap displays. OK, so behind the scenes, if you actually just look at the raw APIs that are made to OpenAI uh, or Azure OpenAI, this is what it looks like. You have an array of messages where we have a uh, user and the content, so what's the weather? And then there's this whole other section that is the list of tools, functions, plugins, whatever you want to call it, uh, that the AI can use. Uh, and this is using JSON schema to describe it as well as all the inputs, right? So what we do with Semantic Kernel when we enable automatic function calling is we take all of your plugins and the functions within them, and we generate this array and combine it with whatever your chat history object is. Okay, so that's that's behind the scenes. What is happening uh, at the API level? Now, um, when we send this over to the AI, when we send this over to OpenAI, um, one of two things happens: the AI either decides, "Hey, because I have these functions that have been described to me with JSON schema." I can either call that function. So here we can see, please create a customer email. And we can send the email. Or if it decides, oh, actually, send email requires information like the uh, who it's sent to, 
the subject, the body that I don't have, the AI will then instead respond with a message asking the user, hey, can you provide this additional information before I can help you, right? And this is why I love automatic function calling so much, because back in the olden days, what you had to do as a AI app developer is you would have to have a step that detected intent, and the whole other step to actually slot fill the function. With automatic function calling, all of this is wrapped up into a single API call. Now, if we assume, assume that the AI did have all the information, let's assume that it knew who to send it to and what the content should be. It will make this function call, right? And then we in semantic kernel will add that function call to the chat history object. Additionally, we actually need to have the results of that function call. So we will invoke that function that you've defined. And in this case, the result of that function is a string that just says email sent. And we wrap this in a tool message so that we can also send that back to the AI in the chat history. And so if you look at the chat history now, what the AI will see when we make our second request is the original user request, the call that it made to, in this case, send an email, the result of that call, and then again, those additional functions that, that it just has access to, right? And so during that second request, it can do the exact same thing. It can decide to call another set of functions, or it can uh, provide a message back to the user. Now, because in this case, the entire scenario has been satisfied, the assistant is going to respond back with a message. But you can imagine this loop kind of going on and on and on until the AI has called all the functions necessary in order to satisfy the user's uh, requirements, right? And that that loop where the AI automatically calls a function, where semantic kernel automatically invokes that function, and semantic kernel automatically hydrating that chip history and asking the AI to come up with the next step. Those three pieces are what compose automatic function calling. Um, so that's that's kind of my fun little visuals. Uh, as part of our doc updates, let's see if I can pull this up. Function calling. Okay. Um, I am much more in depthly uh, kind of walking through all of these different processes. Um, from, hey, what is it like to actually serialize the functions, sending the message messages to the model, uh, all the way to like returning the function results. I get this question all the time. How does actual function calling work? And so while this is very, very in depth, um, if you want to nerd out, you want to actually know what the innards look like. Uh, more importantly, if you want tips on how to make it more effective, um, uh, expect this to land uh, in the next few days um so that you can learn even more about how function calling works and how to make it as performant and reliable as possible hopefully that helped that what you showed at the very end that's not out yet you said it is not out uh i need to add code samples for python and java and then cool. it'll, it'll be pushed out thanks for the explanation that was that was great that was awesome Perfect. I'm seeing a question around where the uh, recorded office hours are located. I'll post a link to it, but it's uh, the Microsoft Reactor's YouTube channel. We have a playlist for all the recordings. There's a couple from the previous weeks that have not yet been uploaded that should be uploaded within the next couple of days. And so feel free to dive in there and see if there's any content that you have missed that you want to dive into further. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Evan. We're so official. We have a playlist in Microsoft Reactor. <laughs> Great, we have a couple minutes left. Are there any projects that individuals are working on that they want to share? Or any things that they need help with troubleshooting as well? I'd love to dive into that if there are no other questions.
If not, we can go ahead and end early. We'll give it a minute more if people are typing at all, but would love to hear any other questions, but we can go and close out if there's nothing else. Great. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate the time today. Cheers. Bye.